I wanted to make a quick connection here on those last two points. As we go into chapter five, the, the, the representation of mm -hmm. the Decalogue, right, which we've looked at a lot extensively in the Exodus series, and you brought up something too, it's, it's the same old, old story that God is reminding them, that Moses is reminding them, that it's not a new teaching, but it is a representation of God's faithful promises and commands. It is expounding on it, as we'll see in this book. It's showing how the, the commandments of God um, are, are applicable to every part of our life. Mm -hmm. But as we go through this chapter five, it's, it's similar to what we've been looking at in Peter, of I, you know, call to remembrance and reminding you of these simple, faithful, eternal truths. So as we go into chapter five with the, the representation of the Decalogue, um, what are some things that we should be uh, focused on in terms of the, the, the importance of hearing and doing the law of God? Absolutely. Well, this is one of the most important sections in the Old Testament. With chapter five, you have the representation of the 10 words, the Decalogue. And then in chapter six, you're gonna get the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one thing to help us understand this to start, this is the section of scripture that Jesus himself is going to be quoting when facing the devil in temptation. So I think that gives it a pretty good framing that this is probably a pretty important section of the Bible uh, to know. Jesus has this memorized. Um, what you're seeing is, again, what God is desiring for his glory and for the blessing of his people is their whole lives are arranged in devotion to him, that there is only one God. And that's a revolutionary concept. If that is true, then all of my life is now informed by the reality of Yahweh, the one true God. And then on top of that, there's the instruction to love him and wholly seek him and be devoted to him. And in the law, you have spelled out all these very thoughtful ways of how that touches every single part of your life, all the fabric of your being. And so you're going to see through this that the phrasing Moses uses, for example, in chapter 5, verse 29, he's talking about how when they said, you know, oh, well, you go hear him and then we'll do whatever he says all the way back, reminding them of what it was like at Sinai. God says in 529, oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and keep my commandments. This would be the best if they just kind of stayed in this trembling place <laughs> at the foot of Sinai all the time. So they hear me, they fear me, and they keep my commandments. Now, when you come into chapter six, though, note the difference. He also then says in chapter six, verse one, now this is the commandment, the statutes and rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land which you are going over, prepping them for it, to possess it. Look at this, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons by keeping all his statutes and commandments. There's this beautiful virtuous cycle. Again, looking at the, there's one God that changed everything. Okay, so all that I am now is for him and under him, him before and above everything that I am and all that I do, they're responding with, we fear this God at the foot of Mount Sinai, so we should keep his commandments. And then now God is also saying, and keep my commandments so that you keep fearing me. Yeah. So you see this beautiful virtuous cycle that the fear of the Lord leads to the obedience of the Lord, but in truth, the rhythms of your life apply to the disciplines of obeying all of this law the obedience of the Lord will lead you to stay in the fear of the Lord. A beautiful thing you see in God's design. And so we see it also with all the concepts of lordship and application in our covenant. Love it. This is also speaking to that next generation. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting the language he uses is like, this is what happened to you. You were there. God spoke to you face yeah, to face. It's a cool they weren't voice. necessarily there. Right. But through the preaching, you have an enlivened uh, picture of God once again. Mm -hmm. It's the same God speaking from Mount Sinai. So the centrality of Mount Sinai is huge. Yep. Our God is a consuming fire. You should fear him. You should tremble at him in, a, in awe and reverence. But Moses is saying, if you've heard this word from Mount Sinai, then you were at the foot of Mount Sinai. It's like you were there. Yes. Right. Yeah, so exactly. even though all the men of war have died, that's why they're entering the promised land. Even though this actual generation maybe wasn't really at the foot of Mount Sinai, they've been, been exposed to the preaching of Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And so they should tremble with that kind of awe and reverence. And I think that's really important for every generation of God's people. Amen. That, like Paul says in Galatians, to the Galatians, Christ Jesus was crucified before your eyes. Right. So as we read scripture, as we're exposed to the glories of God, 
it's like we've been there. And so it's supposed to have the same effect on the heart that actually being at Mount Sinai had, where it stirs you up to keep his commandments, to fear the Lord, which is that virtuous cycle, cycle of obedience. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he brings all this up with the idea of you've seen the glories of God through hearing the Decalogue. If you've heard the Decalogue, it's like you were at Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. If you don't remember what the Decalogue is, it's the Ten Commandments. It just means ten words. Somebody out there is going, what's the Decalogue? <laughs> but he's reminding them, even back in chapter 4, and this is going to run through all of Deuteronomy, to keep your soul diligently, that these things do not depart from you all the days of your life. So in this, there's that sense of urgency, which is, again, that preaching of Moses. Mm -hmm. Keep this. Don't let it go. This is actually vulnerable to being taken. You're going to be in these pagan nations. There will be other gods. There will be temptations. But you need to hold on to these words from Mount Sinai with all that you have. And so throughout this book and starting in chapters 4, 5, and then into 6, Moses is bringing through this sense of you really need to be urgent to keep this. And every generation has to keep it afresh. There's no one that's safe from the nations around, from the temptations around them. Every generation needs to know it for themselves. The word of God is speaking to you today. Right. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, it's really neat too when we come into chapter 6 here. This is, of course, what our Lord is going to refer to as the greatest commandment. But it's very neat to see in the context here of Deuteronomy. Again, he just gave the Decalogue again. But what's the heart of this whole thing? Love God. And so it's more than just a filial obedience or my mind, but there's a thought of the affections of the heart. It's out of an affection that I would keep all these things. And again, the motivation for obedience, the constraining desire towards Yahweh is because I love him. And it's, it's really quite formative here with, with Deuteronomy 6. When you come into verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So again, the idea of Yahweh is one. There is one true God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your, where does love come from? Yeah, your heart, your heart. Uh, It's really wonderful. There's actually not a Hebrew equivalent to the word mind. (laughs) And I think too easily we can bring in too much of the Greek ideas of the worship of the mind. And if I just know facts, then I'll be a whole person. And God's always appealing to the human heart. He's going to talk about in Deuteronomy, and he wants you to circumcise your heart. What is also really neat for the children of Israel is this here, O Israel, that here is the Hebrew word Shema. And even to this day, from this point forward, Orthodox Jews keep this rhythm that developed out of the Jewish society, that these words here, this here, O Israel, became known as the Shema prayer, which you would pray three times a day. And it's this idea of if you're hearing of who Yahweh is, you're going to love him and you're going to live a life of whole devotion and building that rhythm. And it's also really fascinating. The Hebrew word for hear is, they don't have a word for obedience. Um, the word for hear means obey. And at first, You're not might, just hearing it. You're hearing it and you're doing it. That's the concept. So that's really important to understand for the Hebrew mind. If you hear these words to Sam's point, well, I wasn't there, yeah. but you heard the words. So what's expected? It's like you were there and you need to obey as if you were at the trembling mountain and quaking. Uh, We use the same phrasing for our children today. Um, You know, (laughs) did you hear me when I told you to clean your room? Now, I know literally the the auditory signals came and and hit those little bones in your ear. But if you didn't obey me, it must be because you didn't actually hear under my words, respecting who I am as an authority over you and that you're supposed to do what I say. And most importantly, God is saying, it's because you love me. Beautiful elegance here. And again, the, the, the fact that Christ himself is going to reference this and refer to it as the greatest, uh, I think should speak to, we should take our time uh, enjoying Deuteronomy 5 and 6 uh, together here. So The power of God's word being spoken, preached, and expounded on. It is as if you were there at Mount Sinai. Yeah, it's, pretty it's, cool. it's almost as if for us today the teaching and preaching and expounding of God's word regularly, faithfully, is going to be critical to our spiritual growth, just it's, like it was thousands almost of years as ago. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, God's the word of the Lord endures forever, yeah. and it's that timeless truth of it. So if you hear it, do it. 
Amen. Right. Yeah, it's Amen. good. He puts that all through, of course, chapter six with putting it on your doorposts, frontlets of your eyes, teaching it to your children. Mm -hmm. You have to keep this word fresh in front of your face or you forget. Amen. And you have to be diligent to not forget. Yeah. It's kind of neat too in, in Deuteronomy 6, when Jesus talks about this, he's summarizing the entirety of the Old Testament yep. with the Shema. Mm -hmm. And that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second commandment, which Deuteronomy relates to, which is like unto it, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. But getting these concepts, this is what Jesus understood and taught. This is what made what he taught. This is what made what Jesus taught so special because it wasn't rote obedience. Right. It wasn't empty religion. It wasn't what you saw in the Pharisees in his time, which was keeping, quote unquote, all the law, but missing mercy, love, and judgment. Right. He understood, to your point, Sean, that these commands shall be on your heart. It's like it's, it's a weight upon you mm -hmm. that you must love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then that, a pure and devoted love, will inform all the other aspects that are laid out in the law. Amen. Because it's based out of love. It's not just dusty old papers with yeah. uh, old rules that you should be keeping. It's knowing God for who he truly is and then living in response to it. And for Christ to respond to Satan shows he understood the primacy of that. The reason why you ever sin, the reason why you ever disobey God is because you haven't kept the greatest commandment. It's because you don't love God. You know, I mean, it's easy to feign with our lips. I love him, I love him, I love him. Then do what he says. And that's exactly what Christ is pulling through and he will embody in his own life by loving God with all that he is, obeying everything the Father tells him to do. Amen. Yeah. It's beautiful. It, it really is. is beautiful.